Now, if you're an educator and you have to prepare your kids to fly that plane or to work on that plane, mm -hmm. that's a scary thought because mm -hmm. they haven't figured out what makes the plane fly <laughs> and what it keeps it in the air. And how can I prepare somebody for something that it's still evolving, extremely dynamic, you know, from day to day, if not from year to year, right? right. So um, what I mentioned earlier, right, our goal is to give the kids the, 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 the skills and the, and, the, and the competencies to survive or to get a job, get a career. Mm -hmm. Well, I need to know where their job is, I need to know what the career is, and I need to know what I prepare them for. With esports, it's unclear to me what I'm preparing them for, what is unique about esports that I'm preparing them for, what's different from the sports entertainment industry, and I have to say this, right? Sports is a huge phenomenon, cultural phenomenon in the industry, but there's so many sides to it. <coughs> what we're doing at UNT is really the sport business, the sport entertainment business mm -hmm. side of it. My name is Dr. Mark Williams. Welcome to my masterclass. I have a PhD in education from West Virginia University. I have a master's in sport management and an MBA from the University of Massachusetts. I even have an undergraduate degree in sociology from William Patterson University. And currently, I'm the Global Scholar Practitioner at HBCU, Florida Memorial University. But I also work for three of the largest sports brands in the world, Reebok, Champ Sports, and Foot Action, but I can't go anywhere without my Jordan 1s. Join me and my guests as we explore their rise to the top through adversity and challenges. It's time to help you find a hero in you. Welcome to my masterclass. Good day, my friends. Welcome to Dr. Mark's Masterclass Podcast. I am back. I'm your host. It's been two months, my friends, and uh, it was for good reason. Many of you know I was very close to my mother. My mother passed away of COVID, and I'm not here to give any lessons of what people should or shouldn't do, but I'm urging you, my listeners, my viewers, please take this thing seriously. Uh, my mother, as many of you know, suffered from lupus, cancer, and diabetes for the past eight years, and she contracted COVID, and she was gone in two weeks. And so it's not, it's a very serious. I got vaccinated, I got uh, Moderna. Uh, I wasn't going to get vaccinated, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't. I wasn't gonna get vaccinated. Um, and then when I saw my mother in that condition and saw what happened to her, uh, it, I immediately got vaccinated. So I encourage you, I implore you, my friends, please take care of yourselves, take care of the environment, people around you. This is not a political issue. This is serious stuff, my friends. And I pray that one day that we can all be masculine and we can start giving each other pounds and handshakes and hugs again. Because you know I love I love human beings, I love people, but I'm excited to be back here uh, to the MAP Esports Podcast Network. This is what we're powered by by also innovation media enterprises got to give a big shout out to aaron and sia always holding it down and i got my main man a new main man uh aj is gone as you know he's held us down with the uh, audio but i got a new main man called gauge 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 is here he's on the wheel to steal when i say on the wheel to steal you know what i mean by that i don't mean he's like the dj but he holds me down makes me sound good you know what i'm saying he's a sound engineer but today we have a very special guest we have a gentleman here uh who i who i really come to get to know and like a lot because not because he's an academic cat but he's got the coolest accent and he's not from alabama and no you know you're not he's gonna, I'll, i'm gonna let i'm gonna let you guess where he's from Okay, but I got my main man over here, Dr. Bob here, over 20 years in academia, close to 20 years in academia. He's a director of sport management at the University of North Texas at Frisco because there's the Denton campus and there's a the Dallas campus. We're going to talk a little bit about Frisco, with, with how innovative and what's, what makes it different. Uh, so I got to give a big shout out to Dean Randall and, and Dr. Patel. Those are my guys down there. Uh, he was also a director of the PhD program at the University of South Carolina. Got to give a big shout out to Dr. Richard Southall, my main man down there in South Carolina, holding it down. He was at UT Austin over five years. But internationally, uh, he's been to the Netherlands, because I'm not going to say that's where he's from, but he went. He, he did his academic work in the Netherlands. Uh, he also taught there in the Netherlands at uh, two different universities, and he's also in, uh, taught at, at, a, at a university in New Zealand as well. So he's going to talk a little bit about that, the international scene. Um, he, he earned his Ph.D. in sport management from uh, Florida State. Got to give another shout-out to Dr. Jeffrey James. You're wondering, how does Dr. Mark know all of these people? 
And why are they shouting these people out? Because these are people that had some influence on in my life. And I almost went to Florida State. Many of you don't know this. In 2009, I was going to do a PhD in sport management, but I decided to do it in education at West Virginia University. But Dr. Jeffrey James recruited me to come to do my PhD there. And guess what? Dr. Here, that was his first PhD student. See, you got to be nice to people. You don't know how anybody can have an effect on your life. That's why you got to be genuine and kind and nice to everybody because everybody's connected. We're not six degrees of separation. We're more like one degree, especially with the internet now. Uh, we were just having this friendly conversation and he was like, hey, Dr. James, he was my, my advisor. And I was his first PhD student. And I'm like, wow. So that's why you got to be kind to people because you don't know where anybody's going to be when you meet people, when, when you're moving up and when you're coming down. Always be kind to people. Um, he also receives his master's in international affairs from the University of Amsterdam. So without further ado, um, let me introduce you my dear friend, Dr. Bob here. What's up, man? Mark, thanks for having me. Love to be here. Um, and thanks for that that that, that introduction. I, I have to do one correction, otherwise I'm going to just get some angry people. <laughs> I was the first doc student from Florida State, as from Jeff James at Florida State. Yeah. He had doc students before he came. He was at the University of Illinois. There are guys out there, so I didn't, you know, in case they do hear this, and you know, oh, let's so, not give the uh, wrong impression. Uh, oh, so I, I said at Florida State. So not his effort whenever, <laughs> but at Florida State, right? At Florida State. Uh, but yeah, so be proud of that. That's pretty dope. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty dope. And he, is he still the, the head of the program there He's now? He's still the head of the program there. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should go back and get another PhD. No, no, no more PhDs. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. So, Doctor, here, I, I jokingly I joked about your great non-Alabama accent. So tell everybody where are you from? Now I feel like it's a letdown to say that I am from the Netherlands, born and raised, um, and uh, came from a small town called Herugewaard, mm -hmm. which is about 40 miles north of Amsterdam. Uh, I went to the University of Amsterdam and, and spent six, seven years there. That still feels a little bit like my spiritual home. So when people say, well, where are you from? No, where you're really from, mm -hmm. you know, because the first time I tell them Texas and they say, no, no, where you're really from, right. then the answer is always Amsterdam because mm -hmm. um, that still feels sometimes as home, even though I haven't been there in two years because of this horrible thing that's going on. And hopefully uh, people just listen to you and going to get the vaccine because get it. Um, and we can get on with our lives. Listen to the good doctor. Get it, get the vaccine. Did you? Which one did you get? I got Pfizer. Pfizer. No, I, did it. I don't know. You don't know. You, just, you, don't, you know that you got it. <laughs> got the double one. I, no, I think it was Pfizer. Okay. Maybe I'm there now. One of those two. I don't know. What's it? What's it like at UNT? Are they? Um, are they? Um, is it mandatory for professors and students to get the vaccine, or is it? Or is it? What is it like? It's, it's not mandatory. I don't think we're allowed to. Okay. Um, but highly encouraged and. Uh, you know, a lot of promotions of it, uh, a lot of encouragement. And if you don't, right, th there are definitely some things you have to adhere to. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, I, I'm hoping and I'm, I'm assuming that most, uh, particularly the professors, right, older people, they know the risk. Um, I, I think that most of them are vaccinated by mm -hmm. now. But, no, you don't have to. Okay. Uh, and, and this fall, everything goes back to normal, right? We're going to teach face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. uh, again. We're excited about that. Um, so hopefully our students are, uh, are smart enough mm -hmm. and, and, you know, get the vaccine and so they can go on with their lives. So tell me, what, what, in the spring, this past spring, what was it like at your school? Because when I was at Florida Memorial University, um, it, we, we, we didn't make it mandatory that they come to class. They had a choice. They can do it online or come to class. What was it like for you at UNT and Frisco campus? Well, we made as a program, right? So it really depends on program, department, college. But as a program, we decided we wanted to do everything online. Okay. We didn't want to do both because you can't serve two audiences at the same time, right? You, either you do it in person, face-to-face, -face, in the classical way, or you do it online. We wanted to stay online partly because, and this seems counterintuitive, but we do a lot of project-based learning, experiential learning. And you have to huddle up for that. Mm -hmm. And with Zoom <coughs> online, you can put them in breakout rooms. They can meet. You can come back. And in the classroom, we actually were not allowed to get them within six feet. So you couldn't have them huddle up. And if it then becomes kind of like a one-way direction where you just lecture, yeah, you know, we don't do we, we don't lecture to our students. Right. And um, I think that for a lot of our colleagues who are used to lecturing, and a lot of them do it, they hated Zoom because you know. Students zone out. That lecturing you can't do online uh, effectively, but if you use it as meeting time and do project-based learning, Zoom was actually better in that way 
um, than going to classroom. So we were still online, um, and it made it easier to bring in some guests and 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 um, do some stuff with them. So it really didn't hinder that much. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we're excited to go back in person because mm -hmm. it does make a person in a, a difference if you see if you can see someone in their eyes you can shake hands right and particularly guest lectures it, it makes it more personal so mm -hmm. we're excited to go back to normal but we were fine we were fine was it like for you when you were growing up um and growing up as a young man uh what was uh, your parents how much of an influence did they play in terms of how you have developed as, a, as, a, as an individual because one of the things i've learned about you in a few years i've known you is your your spirit of, of loving mankind? Uh, where where did that come from? Wow, my my, my spirit of loving mankind. I, I often get uh, I often get the, the the criticism that I'm actually too critical towards people around me. Uh, so I'll <laughs> say that too. Um, I must not be around you enough because I, I since I've been around you. No, you, you, I, I like yeah. your description better. Yeah. I'll, I'll go for that. <laughs> now, I'll say this right. So I'm I'm I come from a blue collar family. My dad was uh, was a detective uh, or a first a cop, then a detective. My mom was a secretary, mm -hmm. part time first, full time when I got a little bit older, um, and you know worked her butts off their entire life to make something. You know, never had really any education, um, and. Uh, I, I was the first student to go to the university, and mm -hmm. I was my brother, my older brother, went into the navy, and after that he went into uh, uh, the police force, you know, following my dad's track. So I was the first one to go to the university and discover that and 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 find my own way. And I think what I've gotten from that, what allowed me to survive all that and 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 continue to is 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 curiosity, is is openness. Uh, the mantra in my family: work hard and 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 be kind and respectful to everyone. Mm. So you know, I, I like to be critical. You and I are going to talk about esports. So you know how I, yeah, how I feel yeah, about that, yeah. right? And I, I won't talk around that. Yeah. But always with with the kindness and the respect for other people for what they've accomplished or were trying to accomplish. And um, and the Dutch culture in general, we're very. Um, believe in e equality mm -hmm. and 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 there's not a lot of formal distance between people um so it's normal in holland to question other people and and to have good discussions and and and, and debate so i think that kind of like came natural to me and uh and i'm i'm never emotional about it and, and i think you can do that in, in sometimes that got lost here in america mm -hmm. and people get so ingrained in their beliefs and their feelings and um but it, it's fine to disagree and, yeah. and um, you know just have respect uh, for other people's point of view and you know living in a different nation you're used to that and um, yeah it works yeah how, how do you how do you uh, encourage that in your classroom uh, when you have young men and women who might come from American culture where most not all but a lot of us we are get emotional about our points and how do you get them to uh, communicate in a way that's healthy I, well, to encourage creativity, encourage the preparedness of coming to class, mm -hmm. calling them out if they're not prepared, which, you know, I don't always have great teaching evaluations because I call them out and, and they're not used to it. Our, our, the, the, the educational system is not always set up to create critical thinking, to, uh, to encourage that, um, you know, encouraging them to disagree with me. And sometimes make statements that I don't believe in myself, just to get a response from them. And to to find some way that you can have a, a healthy debate, um, and and get their input. Mm -hmm. And and if they do that, and then they get the encouragement, like, hey, you know, this works, or I say something smart or good, you know, then you can build from that, right? They feel mm -hmm. empowered. So, it's 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 not easy. Um, it helps again project-based learning. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more discussion, right? Because you basically give them a project and find a solution and you give feedback. So in many ways, you become more of a mentor and a coach than, than a professor. Mm -hmm. And then it, that comes back to us. I don't like the lecture anymore. Mm -hmm. I used to do it. It's a young professor and, you know, even mid-career. I, I lectured way too much. Mm -hmm. and, and just stop doing that and then really engage and have a dialogue and, and work on projects together. And, it works so much better. What made what made you make the shift? Because when I was coming up and going to college, um, and then eventually going to grad school, one of the things that <laughs> I always found fascinating is is professors, um, you know, have egos like everyone else, and 
professors want to show you how how smart they are and what their research says and does. And college kids are not thinking about, especially in 2021, they're not, they don't care about your research. How did you pivot to get them to engage with you in ways that they understood in the 2021 language of the of the young people that we see now? Yeah, the shift is easy, but I think you're right. I think there's one component lacking there, right? So one mo- motive for for a professor to talk is like, hey, listen, I've I know so much. Let yeah, me yeah, share yeah. that with yeah, you, yeah, right? Yeah. And they're overflowing, like, "Hey, I want to share my story." Yeah. But the second component is that a lot of professors are introverts, and introverts mm. like to control the situation. Mm. And so, introverts are not natural uh, uh, standing in front of a group trying to have a f- f- free-flowing discussion. Mm-hmm. That doesn't come easy to them. That's something that really they have to get used to. So, an introvert will always try to just control the conversation. And how better to do that than have your own PowerPoint, right? <laughs> and go slide by slide because you dictate what's yeah. happening in the classroom. Right. Whereas if you go into this, you know, more interaction and free flow, you have no control over it. And introverts are uncomfortable with that, right? Mm. So those are the two components that you always have to think about. Mm. And something for me as well to overcome. Um, would, you cons- would you consider yourself an introvert? Or, or maybe in the, or between both. Yeah, I, at some point I call myself an extrovert or introvert, mm-hmm. which means you know I'm, I'm comfortable with and around people, but it does take energy, and I always need a day to recharge afterwards <laughs> if it's pretty intense. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, as I grow older, I, I, I feel myself growing more towards actually an extrovert again, which mm-hmm. is really surprising to me because I thought it would be more and more an mm-hmm. introvert. Uh, so it, it's it, I'm in the mi- I'm in the middle of that and. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, part of the reason why UNT attracted me was because of the relationships we could build with the industry and meeting people and create this network for students, mm-hmm. and and I've loved uh, I love uh, doing that. So um, I'm I'm becoming more of an extrovert. Where again, and maybe that's why my teaching is also shifting in that direction. Where yeah, no lectures, and the reason why we actually stopped is TED Talk, mm. and and it's not necessarily TED Talk, but it's a good example of. There are so many amazing platforms nowadays where you can have the one-way direction, where you have the best lectures, where you have the best best stories. You really don't need me anymore to be one of those voices. I can't compete with that either. Mm. So having the students listen to people in their own time, Mm -hmm. whether that's audio or video, and then come to class to discuss that is is much more powerful. Because before the internet, or even the early stages of the internet, they students looked for you as a professor to provide them with the information. Mm-hmm. They're not looking for us to provide them the information. They can find the information on everything and anything, whether it's Siri, Alexa, Google, right? all the information is there. Right. So they don't need us to tell them a story anymore. Mm-hmm. They need us to help us make sense of the story, mm. right? and to evaluate it, and and to synthesize it with other things they hear, and to apply it in their own you know work. And mm-hmm. that's really. <coughs> I started to realize that that's when we make the shift as a program, saying, "Okay, you know what? That's what we're doing. We're not in we're not in the business anymore of providing information. Mm-hmm. We're in the business of helping you transfer, convert information into skills." Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, now, how? What kind of advice would you give to your colleagues, to our colleagues that uh, still have the mindset they want to have control? I mean, there's nothing wrong with having control of your classroom. You should have control of your classroom. But in terms of, because we want to make the, we want to differentiate, differentiate between having control of your classroom by students having respect versus you controlling the whole entire classroom and kids, can, students can't say anything. So what, 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 what Dr. Here is saying that uh, he finds it more advantageous to, uh, you know, have students come with their ideas, but have have the professor there as a sense to help make sense of what the ideas are, and with a little sprinkle of a little bit of let me tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do and what what this is, because I think students will have a, a more healthier respect that way. But how do you, how do you how do you talk to your colleagues or even give them advice on um, you know your teaching methods or teaching styles? Because it's it's obviously it's it may be different from the average, the, from the traditional uh, professor that teaches, that may be teaching at a research one school, or or someone that's teaching in uh, maybe the way my dad taught, or maybe our professors taught us. How how do you communicate with your colleagues that might be frustrated when they say these students aren't listening or these students don't get it? What do you say to those colleagues? Stop lecturing. <laughs> 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 no, hey, listen, I, I'm not going to say that this is. Even innovative, right? I mean, it might be the sixty-seven percent of my, prof- my 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 
my colleagues are already doing this and I was late to the party. So I'm not mm-hmm. going to say like, but if there are people who are still doing it and say, hey, you know, I'm not going to get a response. Mm-hmm. You know, the first step, stop lecturing. Mm-hmm. And and if you're then worried about, well, but I need to give them the information, record your lectures. Mm-hmm. Right? Everybody can do that now. And and for a lot of people have overwon their their fear for online education because they had to the last year. So right. and, and Zoom makes it so easy. Mm-hmm. So if you still want to lecture, <coughs> record all your lectures on Zoom, mm-hmm. post them online, and then you have the lectures, and then basically you're done for the next semester. <laughs> you don't have to do anything, and then when they come to the classroom, you're just going to ask them questions about the lecture. Yeah. You're still worried. Well, I'm not sure if they watched it. I'm not sure if they got the information. Mm-hmm. All right, you start your classroom with 30... Or 50 minutes of questions about your lecture to sure make mm-hmm. sure they, they listen and then put them to work and be comfortable with you know not having to do a little bit it's less work actually right if you're not lecturing it's less work because now you're going to let them work on it you walk around give some feedback and and adjust to the role of being a coach mm-hmm. and it's it's really a mindset it's there is nothing skillful about it it's mm-hmm. less skillful actually mm-hmm. uh, but yeah that, it's it's f- a lot of people are uncomfortable with it and uh, I haven't connected with a lot of my colleagues since the start of COVID about this mm-hmm. right? I am curious what a lot of them will do this fall and how many will go back to lecturing mm-hmm. as nothing has happened right right I can only assume that many of them shifted but I also know people who use online to do online lectures right and they're complaining and then I'm like <laughs> come on don't ask somebody on Zoom to listen you know to watch a screen to either your face or a PowerPoint slide where's all this other stuff is going on right. and there's no check and balances anymore there's no fellow students to correct you there's no polite because you can turn off your camera even right yep, and, yeah. and you can do whatever you want so it you can't lecture through that right. um, and if people still don't see that then I, I feel I feel bad for them well, I just want to friendly remind everyone you're listening to the Dr. Mark's Masterclass podcast. We're talking to Dr. Bob here. He's a director of sport management over at UNT uh, Frisco. And we are powered by Map Esports Podcast Network and Innovation Media Enterprises, Aaron and CS. Shout out to them. Also to my new, new main man, Gage, for the Will to Steal. Um, let's, let's shift uh, the gears a little bit because, um, you know, this is the uh, – the Map Esports Podcast Network. We talk about video games. We talk about the, the industry. We talk about, and now that you and I are here talking as edu- fellow educators, let's get into this thing about esports. Yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Here and I, a few years ago, we started talking about esports and academia. Um, you know, <laughs> We both have backgrounds in sport management. He has his PhD in sport management. I have my master's in sport management, and I worked in industry. And um, and so we have a healthy respect for each other's background in our work. But one of the things that I was really uh, serious about and still serious about is uh, esports uh, as it relates to the academic side. Uh, I was saying that, hey, we should have a major, and this is how it should be, and schools are so far behind, they're not going to get it. And then Dr. Hero's like, wait a minute, Mark, <laughs> is it really a discipline? Do they really need a major? And this fun because now, after two years, I thought about it. I, I, I as, as we, as Animal Health, we seen, we saw, we came, right? I, I, uh, I'm now, I'm now leaning more towards your ideology. Tell, tell everybody what your thoughts are about esports as a discipline or as a major at the college level or even at the high school level. What, what, what is it about the topic or just the, what it is that 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 kind of like makes you like, okay, let's slow down, everybody. Well, I, and I'm just going to paraphrase, not cite because I haven't memorized it, but I'll paraphrase uh, Jason Lake, right, the CEO of Complexity, one of the oldest, most respected uh, esport organizations, who uh, who once said, um, you know, we're building the plane as we fly it. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're an educator and you have to prepare your kids to fly that plane or to work on that plane, mm-hmm. that's a scary thought because mm-hmm. they haven't figured out what makes the plane fly <laughs> and what it keeps it in the air. And how can I prepare somebody for something that it's still evolving, extremely dynamic, you know, from day to day, if not from year to year, right? right. So um, what I mentioned earlier, right, our goal is to give the kids the, 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 the skills and the, and, the, and the competencies to survive or to get a job, get a career. Mm-hmm. Well, then I need to know where their job is. I need to know what the career is, and I need to know what I prepare them for. With esports, it's unclear to me what I'm preparing them for, what is unique about esports that I'm preparing them for, what's different from the sports entertainment industry, 
And I have to say this, right? Sports is a huge phenomenon, cultural phenomenon in the industry, but there's so many sides to it. <coughs> what we're doing at UNT is really the sport business, the sport entertainment business mm -hmm. side of it. Now, esports fits really well in there because that's what esports is. It's it's creating a sport out of a video game, mm -hmm. entertaining people. Right. So in that regard, it fits into our normal curriculum. It means that the competencies we teach to our students apply to that industry mostly. Uh, you know, whether you talk about corporate partnerships, where you talk about analytics, where you talk about um, uh, communication, uh, you know, operations, yeah. marketing. Right? So, uh, mm -hmm. um, so in that regard, there is not that there is uniqueness to the esports or some of these esports, but there is also uniqueness to the football industry, there's uniqueness to the horse racing industry, there's mm -hmm. uniqueness to the golf industry. Doesn't mean that we need golf management, football management, and horse race management, right? And that's with esports. And again, that, that title is misleading because you should technically then say, you know, Counter Strike and um, Rocket League, and, you know, and, and, and all of these are different again, right? Uh, because they use different formats and different ways. So, so and do you then, think that academics? Because, you see, look, everyone, <laughs> esports is just a sliver of the video game industry. It's like maybe 7% of it. So when I hear people say, we're going to start an esports uh, major, and I'm looking at academics, the provost, the, the deans, and I'm looking like, why? Because it's like saying you're going to start uh, sport management, but you're going to just focus on basketball. Okay. Right. And and that that's the that's the problem I have now. Because when you open my eyes to that, when you start pre telling me, and I won't say preaching, when you're telling me this, I'm now looking at how how I have my doctorate and in, um, in curriculum. So as I'm thinking about writing curriculum, I'm thinking, wait a minute. As I'm thinking about this, this is this is just a sliver of it. So you really shouldn't be making esports uh, majors. You should maybe looking at concentrations and how do you fuse it with, with sport management because mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 part of that. It's part of that. So how do you communicate to a provost or to a dean or to a chair about or even a parent about what where, how esports can live in academia? Yeah, well, I got the question of UNT when it came. UNT is 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 very innovative when it comes to esports, right? We have we have a thriving uh, uh, team uh, within our intramurals. Our our teams are very competitive. We give out scholarships based on esports. Um, <coughs> so the president asked me, saying, "Should we have an esports program?" And I was the one who said, "No." But should we have esports integrated into our sports entertainment management business degrees? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and you know we have great relationships. And I mentioned complexity earlier. Uh, you know, we've uh, John Davison is, is a good friend of mine. He's on an advisory board. I've had uh, lots John of John Davison is a Map Esports Yes podcast. He's one of my colleagues here as well. Yes, there we go. Yep. Uh, you know, we have, have I've had interaction with the guys from Team Envy and and um, early on with with the the, the the Infinity when it was still at, at our in our at our offices. Mm -hmm. So you know. We have we have students who work for them, um, and and so we have an integrated. We do case studies, we do projects, we have, bring guest lecturers in. Um, so it's not like we ignore it. Mm -hmm. We just don't see it as indeed as a uniqueness because you mentioned you, you compare saying hey you don't have a basketball degree, but I would say with esports is even more dangerous because it's not one sport. Right? You have let's say five, ten, fifteen, twenty different slivers right, right of that video gaming industry. And that's what we've still been looking at, and we haven't figured that part of the puzzle out, is that the video gaming industry is enormous. Mm -hmm. right? That's the big industry. That's bigger than the music industry, bigger than the, the movie industry. Uh, is there something more we can do there that's, that's, that's in between engineering, software, business, entrepreneurship, right, where you can bring that together? Because mm -hmm. I think that is a very intriguing uh, um, field that mm -hmm. I still think we don't serve as well as we could. Mm -hmm. um, Esports is just, yeah, a small sliver of it. And, it. and it's a fascinating world, and I love it because lo I'm, I'm drawn by entrepreneurship, and there's a lot of entrepreneurship, and I'm drawn by innovation, and there's a lot of innovation going on. Mm -hmm. um, we have a partnership with Stadia Ventures, which is an accelerator. They actually do an esports event tomorrow that mm -hmm. I'm attending. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we're definitely plugged in. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't think there's a need for an esports degree and I'm very worried about universities that start this degree and I question sometimes the motives is, is that because they actually feel a need from the industry that they have to prepare the students for or are they attracting students with a degree that speaks to them and their generation 
and uh, just to get them to the university, but we're not preparing them for the next step, right? So mm. that is my, uh, I'm worried about that. So I mean, think, are, we, are we questioning the integrity of higher education now because of the getting attendance up? <laughs> not, not the integrity, yeah. uh, but I think that every university has always has to figure out, you know, one end, hey, we need to bring in the students. Right. Right? There, there are two sides to that, to that, uh, that pipeline. You have right. to bring them in, you have to produce them. Um, I say about sport management sometimes, and this is the reason why at UNT there are actually BBA and MBA degrees, right? Mm -hmm. So there are actually concentrations within the business degree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it lures students in, and that's fine because they will walk away with a BBA degree. And if they can't get that dream job with the Cowboys and the Mavericks or the Rangers, you know, they get a BBA degree and they'll be hired by Southwest, Amazon, mm -hmm. Farmers Insurance, or whatever the company is, right? right. Um, um, so in that regard, if, if you do a, a business degree with a concentration in esports that prepares these kids for uh, get some graduate and get some job <coughs> that don't necessarily have to be in esports, I have no problem with that. Yeah, I have a my, my issue <coughs> right now is um, universities, um, are ch especially after COVID, are challenged with enrollment and uh, what is it going to what, what are we going to do to get students to come to our school? And I think <coughs> not questioning the integrity of, of universities, but my mine is about intention. Uh, if it's, it's to get enrollment, that's great, but hire people that really understand the business of it because your, your students are not going to get jobs. So you can bring all the students in you want, but we just happen to be here in Dallas right now or in, or in Arlington or in Frisco, which is like the Silicon Valley for esports and for the gaming industry. So if you go to school down here, high school or college down here, you, or even middle school or grammar school, you're, 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 you can find a school or you can find opportunities here because we're right here. Yeah. However relationship driven okay so for me um it's not about it's really about how how are we communicating the message to our students how are we attracting the students and what kind of um how are we setting it up at the university is it going to be a concentration is it going to be a certificate program is it connected to sport management is it going to be like uh is it going to be like the ohio state and and it, and it touches various different uh, uh programs uh so everyone's different yep. and they have to figure out what's what's different and unique about it one thing i love about unt frisco is that that's different from UNT Denton? Um, is that you are wait, 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 hold on. UNT Frisco is a college within UNT Denton, right? right? So it, right. It, they are the same. They're the same, but in terms, same. Of, in terms of what you do in your specific your campus where you're at, is that you're more would say more experiential learning? Would you say more innovation? I well, that I, I would think that's program specific. Yeah, UNT Frisco would like to be. Uh, as innovative as 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 possible, and and mm -hmm. focuses really on on that that experiential component. Right. I don't want to short sell UNT Denton, right? Which no. which is the overall campus, and and where many professors are doing exactly the same. Uh, but if you look at it at from UNT Frisco, it's the college there. Yes, they make it a big point to to impress on their uh, faculty and and on their support staff to be as innovative and, and mm -hmm. experiential as possible. So let's say a, a parent wants to send their child to a campus, UNT. They want their child to go to UNT. There's three different campuses. There's, there's, there's Denton, which is a larger campus. There's Frisco, and then there's Dallas. And so they all have three different demographics almost, right? So for the Dr. Mong, who's the president of uh, UNT Dallas, uh, they may serve the, the community. The, the household income might be about 30000 or so, right? So there's a different demographic that they're servicing there. I think 74% of the students that go there are women. So they're now trying to attract men, particularly men of color, because it's mostly a Hispanic serve institution. So that's so. If, so you have something. If you if you think your child wants to go to a school that is smaller, uh, but it's part of the UNT system, uh, then that may be a, a school for you. If that's th th that's the area you want to go into, possibly. Then you have UNC uh, Frisco, where you're at. Tell us a little bit about your campus and how it differentiates itself from UNT Dallas and then UNT Denton. Yeah, and, and, and again, that's, and, and I know this is confusing to a lot of people who are from the DFW area. Uh, UNT Dallas is its own university, mm -hmm. separate, separate. Right? completely separate, okay. partly because of the things you just mentioned, right? Um, UNT Denton is an R1, Carnegie ranked research university, right? The highest category, um, um, the, let's say the flagship university within the, in the system. Mm -hmm. Uh, UNT Frisco is a college that is part of UNT Denton, mm -hmm. and so it, it's it's they're not two separate entities. So everything that 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 matters 
for Unity. Denton is the same for Frisco. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have to meet the same Carnegie One ranked university expectations, including in a business school, including for faculty, uh, who we hire, how you know all those things. So there's a lot of overlap, of course, between Unity and Denton and Frisco, and, and and probably for a lot of students, it's just I mean, where they're taking their classes, right? They don't feel like they're part of either one. Okay. Now, having said that, UNT Frisco is somewhat of the dependence. It's, it's you know it's its own little you know entity um, where you know where y you can do things, you can experiment a little bit more, you can do things that that maybe in Denton you know you have less space for just because of the surroundings, the city of Frisco, right, the entrepreneurship, the innovation there. Uh, that that kind of like seeps into the university as well. For some reason, the universities are some kind of you know, isomorphic system that they kind of like adapt to the environment, right? right? And and so you see UNT Frisco, that college adapting to Frisco, whereas UNT Denton, of course, has been there forever, and that's, you know, their own thing. Okay. So out of all the schools that you've been at, you've been to, been internationally, you've been at University of, of, University of Texas, you've been a lot of places. Um, what, what makes UNT Frisco something that speaks to your soul and your spirit? What makes you want to get up every day and say, I, got, I can't wait to go to work? I mentioned it earlier. I'm a first generation student. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I was the first in my family to go to university. Didn't know, you know, what to expect. Mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't a really good student either. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I mean, I you know, I didn't really know what it was about. I didn't get it. I was sitting in the back, mm -hmm. listening to my professors. So now and then, I was a bartender those days. So I mm -hmm. bodied a lot. Uh, I, I probably got saved because you know I'm pretty good at reading and <laughs> and you know do, doing independent learning let's say that way mm -hmm. uh and that's how i got through but i uh and that stuck with me right i was like listen if i didn't get everything out of my education that i should at that level of course then i did my phd it was a whole different story mm -hmm. um but as a first generation <coughs> student I've, i feel connected with people like that mm. and um, when you're at the flagship university right that was at the University of Texas at Austin University of South Carolina and Columbia right the flagship universities you do have students that mostly their parents went to university they know what they expect they're you know middle class upper class you know well-to-do families kids often haven't had work before you know they go to college because you know they were taken care of and so now and then I struggle with connecting with that because that was not my background, right? And I had to work myself through college. And mm -hmm. my parents supported me, gave, you know, helped me, but, you know, I worked 30 hours a week. Mm. And that's the kind of student that you have at UNT. Mm -hmm. uh, they're first generation students, um, very diverse, majority minority school, mm -hmm. uh, which I love as well because, again, you get more diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and kids who just, you know, pull up their sleeves and, and go to work, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're often working particularly our undergrad students are working through school and so yeah I, I recognize myself in them and 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 that's that's the first American university where I really had that connection whereas with you know Florida State South Carolina Texas that was a slightly different mm. background student yeah I find it fascinating um, the just the, the mindset you have as far as identifying with young people that are first generation or students that had to work hard um, you know the days of our parents or us working 30 40 years at a job is probably over um, you're gonna have to have various skill sets and I think in the next 10 15 years you're gonna run into young people whether no matter what kind of family they come from that we're gonna see a more ethnically diverse group of young people coming up the ranks in terms of going to college uh, what do you what do you what advice would you give to parents and even educators in terms of um, how we should engage with young people uh, now in our society that we live in now with we're, we're more diverse ethnically uh, more diverse in, in many ways how do you how do you get people to pivot when they already think a certain kind of way and in, in, in terms of how they're going to deal with these young people coming up and how would I talk to teachers and parents I mean that's tough I, I hardly ever talk to parents you know, my students are grown-ups. They have to figure it out for themselves. You heard right? that. <laughs> uh, and I would be very uncomfortable around parents because, like, if, if I'm talking to a parent, there's something wrong there already. Why are you talking to a parent about them coming to, coming to, your, camp, coming to your campus if you went on a recruiting trip with, with, with the admissions office or something to that nature? No, I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. and I, have, I, I might have had a couple of conversations, but very few, mm -hmm. and I'm uncomfortable with conversations because to me that's already, that's, that's the wrong conversation, right? I shouldn't be talking to parents. I should be talking to, to the kids, the 18-year-old, mm. 70-year-old. And you have to talk to them directly and say, hey, listen, why are you doing? What are you trying to do? 
And if you're in my field, mm -hmm. which is an aspirational field, and everybody wants to work for the Cowboys, everybody wants to work for the Mavericks, right? Yep. Uh, telling them straight from the start. Right? Mm -hmm. So I don't recruit. Mm -hmm. I disrecruit. Mm. I tell them, like, listen, you want to do this? You better be ready for it. And um, here's stadiumpeople.com. I'll give the link to everybody who listens to this. <laughs> they do the event staffing, the ticket takers at the AT&T Stadium. They always need people, right? These are the people for 10 bucks per hour. Go sign up, get your first job in the sport industry. Get it on your resume, start interning, start talking to people. You better be prepared to come to class and do the work. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? It's really hard to get into this industry. And mm -hmm. if you're not, if you don't have the grit, the determination, and the passion for it, mm -hmm. And you're just going to show up in class and get your, you know, your B plus or your A minus, and you know, graduate with your 3.6, and there ain't going to be a job for you in the sport industry. You're going to be fine in life because you know there are lots of jobs nowadays. Mm -hmm. But if this is what you want to pursue, I'm not going to talk you into it. That's 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 the wrong thing for you. Gotta me to have do. it already. You you, you got to have that passion. Right now, and then for me, it really doesn't matter um, if you're. You know, and I don't necessarily, as a foreigner, think too much in ethnic and race, and then it's sometimes uncomfortable f for me or for other people because, I'm, you know, I'm I'm a foreigner. You're all American to me, uh, yeah. but I think often in social class, socioeconomic classes, and understanding that there's a lot of systemic racism in this nation that makes it more likely yeah. that right, a black person is lower socioeconomic first, et cetera, right? But um, what I want to note, and if I had that conversation, I feel the degree of determination is there. It's like, okay, now let's talk about the barriers you're facing. How mm -hmm. can we overcome this? Do right. you have to work? Do you have to make money while you're in school? Can you do an internship? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and talk with them about things like that so I understand, can I help you in some way to make you see past the barriers you've created for yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, and then emphasizing, get, get engaged. And um, so that's what with kids or with parents. And then with the industry, I've been fighting for paid internships <laughs> hmm. because that's a huge uh, uh, exclusionary uh, um, um, barrier to getting into the industry, right? Mm -hmm. And and and, um, and I tell you know, all the organizations here in Dallas-Fort Worth, like get paid internships because if you're not, you're excluding a big part of our students for your jobs because they can't give up their job to come intern for you for free. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of those old men still with that mindset like, oh, I did it when it's like, you know, I just, you just got to show the determination. Like, no, you didn't have to pay the bills. These kids have to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Give them a paid internship so they can come. And then you'll see that your pool becomes much more diverse as well. Mm -hmm. And you no longer have these, let's say, flagship university kids. Mm -hmm. that don't have to work and can do all these things for self-actualization and self-development. Well, well, one of the things that I found fascinating, you, you invited me to this boot camp that you do for your graduate students. And when I got there, I didn't know what to expect. I just thought, boot camp, um, this should be interesting. He's got the Dallas Cowboys facility. This should be interesting. But what I found more fascinating was about 85, maybe 90% of your students are students of color. I, I, was that accidental? Or that, again, you're, you're, like I said earlier in the conversation, you're your spirit and your 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 mindset in terms of how you deal with people, you deal with people based on the spirit, and just and also the fact that you identify with a lot of people that might be blue collar type people. And not saying all black people are blue collar. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is that you you I seem to identify with everyone, like me. I, I talk yeah. to everybody. How how is it that UNT Denton, uh, Carnegie Mellon, you know, Research One School, you know. You know, they don't have a high percentage of minorities, but in your program, you just seem to every year ha attract students of color. How, how is that? How, is that by design or did, what, how, how did that happen? I, I, I would love to take credit for it, um, but I, I, well, I don't know. Maybe I, I, I do draw them. Um, maybe my recruitment conversations are more honest, more straightforward, uh, and, and I can connect with them. Um, I don't think it was 80, 90 percent, right? But it's it's a, it's a, we're very proud of that. Right? Mm -hmm. It's it's literally if you see our, you know, the Zoom sessions, right? Where you see all the profiles, like this is like a United Colors of Benetton, you yeah. know, commercial, and yeah. and and so we're very proud of that. <clears throat> and, and it's part of DFW that we have that, fortunately, as well. I think that with our uh, the program you were talking about is our online MBA program, right? 
uh, which is for working professionals, right? Okay. So you have to have work experience. And I think that we, we are drawing uh, black Latino students to that is because they never had the opportunity to get the extra education that they needed, mm-hmm. now to get a job. Mm-hmm. And then they're looking at programs, hey, can we do this? Our online is for work professionals. You don't have to go do a GRE or a GMAT, which is a huge barrier for people of color. Mm-hmm. Um, and particularly if you're already out there for years, right? I mean, suddenly you have to do a standardized testing. Your brain is not trained like that, so you, you struggle with that. Um, and and so and then we have the partnership with the Dallas Cowboys, mm-hmm. which I think also reaches a, a non-traditional audience. So now and then, mm-hmm. um, and but yeah, no, I, we're, we're excited about them. We 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 make sure that they can connect with people like them, mm-hmm. right? Uh, in in natural way. So here's the th- one of my pet peeves: mm-hmm. a, a, a panel formed with women who are going to talk about women in the industry, mm-hmm. or you know panel of black people talking about black people in the industry. Mm-hmm. And, well, it's it's going to be like these cheerleader choir stuff like, hey, let me tell you what's you know, politically correct instead of, no, just have black people on a panel talking about sponsorship and women talking about marketing and finance. And 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 so we, you know, and our panels, you saw that, like great diversity. Yes. But we're yes. not necessarily talking about, hey, well, how does a, a black woman make her way into the industry? Right, right. Um, what we do to ask them is stick around, have lunch with them, so they can ask you that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Follow yes. up with you. Right? Yes. And you yes. saw those conversations yes. happening as well, and I think that's much more powerful. Yeah, well. and it was very natural. And what's one of the things that I liked about it, I mean, I, I've gone to I graduated from UMass Amherst, one of the, if not the best, you know, leading program in sport management in the country, one of the few first programs founded uh, in the country. Um, and there was only three people of color in my class. And uh, and 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 uh, Ohio U, the first school founded uh, sport management, uh, you know, every every one of these larger schools um, are doing a great job now at, at looking at diversifying their um, their their cohorts. Um, one of the schools that, that does the fantastic job is University of Central Florida with Dr. Richard Lapchick. Um, and I love what S- uh, South Carolina is doing with Dr. Southall and those guys down there. But um, what do you see the future in terms of when we look at esports, we look at sport management, what do you see the future in the next 10 years in terms of more students of color and more women, ethnic minorities um, that, 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 that may enroll in these types of graduate schools? Do you see um, more, more and more uh, students of color, women uh, or ethnic minorities enrolling in these programs if they if they adapt, if schools adapt to the model that you prescribe at, at UNT, what do you see it just kind of just flattening out, in your opinion? Well, it's hard for me to say what, what other schools are doing. I know UMass has has has, has great uh, diversity on their on their staff, and effectively mm-hmm. they do great research on on gender equality there mm-hmm. that that, that uh, puts them on the map. Of course, you know now what Labshack is doing there. Um, I think that at, at what what we're really thinking of um, is is what I'm seeing in the industry, let's say this way, is there is right now more demand for people of color than ever before. Mm-hmm. So from a first cohort that just graduated this this spring, some of them in December, May, kind of like some of them postponed it because of COVID, and it's very hard to get jobs right now. Um, the, the black female students of our cohort were, were the ones, you know, one with the Cowboys, uh, internship or will hopefully convert into a job. The other one is 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 hired by uh, Allen Americans in business development. There's demand there, right? Mm-hmm. So I I do feel, and I haven't felt it before, like a real need f- coming from the industry fund. Hey, we need w- the the message has been received. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not certain. I'm not going to be naive enough to say, hey, this is going to last forever. Right. But right now, I, I would almost say that there was no better time to be a black student graduating from sport <laughs> management than right now because yeah. th- they feel they have to. And, yeah. and hopefully that will remain. Um, yeah. And if so, then then what you will get if that happens is, of course, the more people of color that are working in the industry, the more um, the stronger network, the more people they, they will hire from that, right? Because mm-hmm. that's the problem with sport is so many people want to work for them. Mm-hmm that they almost have to rely on network to, to hire someone, right? So mm-hmm. teamwork online, you'll get a thousand plus applicant for one job. Mm-hmm. You don't have time to go through a thousand plus mm-hmm. one page resumes. And how are you gonna separate one page separate, you know? Right. That's, that's, so what you're doing is you're relying on people, hey, you know, do you know somebody here? Do you know something? Let's bring it back to a stack of 20 and now we're gonna start talking. Right. Well, if you get people in your organization now that have different backgrounds and are more diverse, that means that, that that initial stack will also be more diverse. And that's always been 
the problem in sport management because, well, nepotism is a negative word. I'm not going to say it's negative, but it is that network. And, yeah, if the network is white, then it's going to be you know, coming in with more white students, and, and hopefully that's changing. Yeah, I think so. And I, I, what you're doing at UNT, at Frisco, with your, with, your, uh, with your dean and your colleagues there is just phenomenal. And, and I, again, um, I, I've enjoyed getting to know you. I'm still getting to know you. I'm excited about moving down to Dallas again and learning more about the Frisco campus uh, and you. But, uh, but there's something that I, I, you, you mentioned to me before. Uh, I, I, you, you may have forgotten about it. But we're, we're going to have to get uh, Dr. here back here again to maybe talk more in depth about it. But uh, this Dutch soccer team, okay, <laughs> talk. <laughs> tell me about that. How did that come into an existence? It, that was a few months ago. Now, did, did, you, are you, did you purchase it, or are you one of the, one of the owners now? What's, what's the deal? Oh, I thought you were wanted to talk about the national team and, and, and the embarrassing loss of the Euro. So okay, no, I don't want to say. I wasn't okay. going to say that. I wasn't no, going to bring that uh, up. <laughs> so I I got approached uh, um, about three four months ago by a group of investors here in, in in Dallas who had an interest in a in a Dutch professional soccer team, and asked me for advice. Um, and that was something, of course, very close to my heart. It's something that you know, as a teenager, I dreamed of. I playing football manager and running a team and. And um, and something I, I I know a lot about because of my background and I worked for Johan Cruyff at, at some point in my career and Johan Cruyff is one of the most famous players uh, coaches of all times guy behind FC Barcelona and and Ajax Amsterdam um, so when they came to me that really lit a fire a passion that I kind of like didn't even realize that was still there um, so I became involved of kind of like the the party that submitted the bid as as as, as a managing partner. Um, ultimately, the bid fell apart a couple of weeks ago mm. um, because of the politics and, and the complexity in that part for that particular team, which was even for Dutch or European standards outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there, there there were some great new friendships forged and great new network activated that was pretty dormant for me. Mm -hmm. And so who knows where that will lead and, and maybe there's going to be another team or another investor group that wants to, uh, to talk about that. So you, you heard that. So everyone that's out here now that is, that is <laughs> interested in investing in, in, in Dutch soccer or, or anything around sport, but particularly soccer, maybe Dutch soccer. Uh, Dr. Bob here is sitting right here. So uh, Dr. Hare, tell everybody how to get in contact with you if someone wants to, to learn more about the program at UNT Frisco or if they want to get advice from you or if they just thinking about coming to graduate school yeah it, it's very easy if you know how to spell my name you can find me because I'm the <laughs> most famous Bob here in the world that's not a brag that's you know it's not a common name so you can find me just by typing Bob dash or Bob uh, here h-e-e-r-e -E -E. um, my email address is bob dot here at unt dot edu um, and you can find me there and, and um, I'm easy to find and I always respond to emails uh, I always love meeting new people talk to new people and if I can help anyone we'd love to and it's been a pleasure talking to you on the air. We, and as you can tell, Dr. Hare is very honest, very straightforward. He's not going to not gonna sugarcoat anything. Uh, he's not rude either. Uh, but we have had our healthy uh, conversations. I never got upset talking to him. Uh, but now, like I said, he and I are, are pretty much almost on the same page when it comes to uh, esports and, and uh, higher education. Uh, but we both have definitely a, a great love for sport, a great love for people. And again, I just want to say thank you again to all of everyone that's, that's all my uh, listeners that are back. Uh, I'm so happy to be back uh, to Dr. Mark's Masterclass Podcast. Be listening out for and watch out for another episode in the next week or so. And um, I'm excited to be back, as I said, once again. And again, please remember, please protect yourselves and practice, practice, practice good health. Wash your hands, all that good stuff. Wear your mask. Uh, we're not wearing masks right now because we're kind of far apart from each other. But, um, you know, I still I still rock my mask. I got my mask right here, as you see. Um, so you've been listening to Dr. Mark's Masterclass Podcast on the Math Map Sports Esports Podcast Network, powered by Innovation Media Enterprises. Shout out again to Aaron and Sia. Thank you for holding me down always. And again to my main man, Gage. Thank you, Gage, again with uh, for making sure that we sound great. And remember, you can control three things, my friends. You can't control other people. You can control what you think, what you do, and what you say. Remember that. You can control what you think, what you do, what you say. Thank you again. We look forward to seeing you soon. Peace. Thanks for listening to Dr. Mark's Masterclass. I pray you enjoyed yourself today. I had a good time. I don't know about you, but this podcast is part of the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network and is produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and let us know how we're doing by leaving a comment or a review. 
class dismissed. 